welcome back to the Wildlife Garden Project. Dragonflies and damselflies make up some of our most beautiful insects and today we're going to be finding out all about them. I'm joined by Lauren from the British Dragonfly Society and I'm going to be picking her brains to find out some of the measures we can all put in place to help dragonflies and damselflies. So tell me, why do dragonflies need our help? Well, dragonflies um, use gardens a lot and gardens can be an amazing place to see them and watch them do their thing. And when we talk about dragonflies, we mean both the larger dragonflies and the smaller fluttery damselflies. So we collectively refer to them as dragonflies. Throughout the UK, habitat has been changing and the way we use our land has changed so we've lost a lot of great quality wetland habitat um, and some aren't managed with um, wetlands and dragonflies in mind they've also been affected by pollution both agriculturally and through industry and historically we've changed a lot of our wetlands we've converted rivers to canals and straightened rivers and all of this has a massive impact on the wildlife that uses that space um, and climate change is affecting dragonflies it is altering their distribution often pushing species north and squeezing those that are already further north and rely on specialized habitat so gardens can play a vital role in their conservation we can replace and make up for uh, the habitat that's lost and provide them a little slice of wetland heaven in our own back gardens. That's it isn't it, it's that all these little spots, all these little spaces and once you add them together that can make such a huge area yeah. so it really does matter doesn't it the things that we do in our gardens. Definitely. Yeah and of course who doesn't want to see a dragonfly in their garden? I mean they're, they're beautiful creatures aren't they? They're incredible having that aerial display in your own back on to watch at your own leisure i mean they're incredibly phenomenal flyers they're super fast up to 30 miles an hour they can turn on the spot and fly backwards and hover watching them catch prey in that way is so impressive as well as watching them interact with uh, your pond if you're lucky to have you know water in your garden um, it's fascinating to watch and their life cycle is so fascinating the way they interact with each other and they're just the most beautiful array of colors from yeah. metallics to those really bright primary reds and blues and greens I mean it's just fascinating and I think you can spend a lot of time getting to grips with telling them apart and enjoying watching them Tell me a little bit about the life cycle of the dragonfly. Yeah, so our dragonflies spend the largest proportion of their life underwater. So they live as eggs and larvae for an average one to two years, um, up to five years in some species. So a pond is incredibly important for that part of their life cycle. Once they're ready to emerge, they'll crawl out and do their final molt on surrounding vegetation. They'll leave that little skin behind, an exuvia, and emerge as an adult. At this point, they're really pale, so they develop their colour through that day, and they'll often then move away from water to feed, uh, so they don't have to be near a uh, wetland at that stage in their life in order to uh, feed and mature. And it's then, once they're mature, that they'll return to water in the hope of finding a mate. And then um, our males will grasp a female in tandem, and it's then that the female is ready to lay eggs. So she'll find a good spot on water, on vegetation, plants, rotting wood, or even just straight into the water um, to lay her eggs ready for that next generation. So it sounds like there's a lot of variety, even between species. Yeah. And we also need to support the dragonflies in every stage of their life. So yeah. we've got a lot to find out about, haven't we? Yes. So ponds are, as we know, one of the best things that you can incorporate into a wildlife garden. But we're going to find out what specifically we can do to make that pond friendly for dragonflies. Mm -hmm. So let's start off with size. Does size matter? Well, when creating uh, a pond, you need to work with your own space. So of course, the larger pond that you can create, the better. It will support more species, different types of wildlife. But what's important is 
the space that you have. So putting in any pond will be vital habitat no matter what. But yeah, if you can utilize a space and create a larger pond, that's amazing. But alternatively, if you live in an urban area, you have a really small garden or even a balcony, a container pond can provide incredible habitat. It could be a stopgap, yes, but we've also had damselflies breeding in very small container ponds. So you can definitely do your bit for dragonflies, no matter what space you have. So you've had records of, of dragonflies breeding in, and how big was this pond? Oh, only about 50 centimetres across. Wow, was it like a washing up bowl type thing? This or like was a, a barrel, the bottom of a ah, barrel. Oh, right. Yeah. That's amazing, isn't it? So it does Incredible. go to show even the smaller space. As you say, anything's better than nothing. Definitely. Um, and how about the shape then? Does the shape of a pond matter at all? Well, it's using the space that you have, uh, but the best case scenario is an undulating shape. So not only will you make your pond look more natural, but you also increase the length of the edge, which provides a bit more space then for dragonflies to perch and bask and egg lay. So yeah, that is the best best case scenario, and it looks really natural and really lovely yeah, in the space. It does, yeah. I don't want a square pond. No. No, no. <laughs> and how about depth then? Because, you know, obviously shallow water is good for a lot of, of creatures, isn't it? But what, what about dragonflies? Yeah, so we would recommend the middle um, have a good depth, at least 60 centimetres if you can. That will safeguard against drying out, so you'll retain more water through the summer and it also helps uh, to make sure it doesn't freeze solid in the winter so from that depth then getting shallower towards the sides so making sure that our lava can emerge and of course for other wildlife that they can use that pond and exit safely hmm. so nice shallow edges and, the, and talking about the edges then so you know as you mentioned it's nice to have a sort of shallow area yeah um but if somebody has made a pond with pond liner or even with a preformed pond, how do we make that pond look natural? How do we sort of disguise the plastic? Yeah, it's a great question. There's lots of different things that we can do and actually doing a bit of everything um, is great. So that variety is lovely. So having rocks and stones is great for basking. They get nice and warm. You'll attract other wildlife with that as well. Um, having some cutoffs of wood and rotting wood is great. Some species of dragonfly will lay eggs directly into that softer wood. Um, areas of moss and plants are great perching and egg laying as well for dragonflies. And with all of that, you'll get lovely variety and hopefully a natural look to your edges. Because that's what you want, don't you? Yeah. You want to look out and just see it as a beautiful, natural area. Exactly. And it sounds like a lot of this advice, as you say, it's this is all stuff that is beneficial to so many other creatures as well, isn't it? Yes. Um, so it's all good advice to take on board anyway. Um, is there anything else that you can think of that you would recommend if somebody's planning a pond or even upgrading an, ex an existing pond? Is there anything else you can think of that they need to think about? Yeah, so uh, with a brand new pond, um, thinking about your location is important. So you want a nice sunny spot that is sheltered so it's not going to get battered by the wind, but you don't have too much overhanging vegetation like trees. If they're dropping leaves in, you'll have a problem with nutrients in your pond and having to clean it out a lot. So it'll help you out um, to have a little less overhanging. You don't want too much shade. Mm -hmm. Um, and then thinking about the water that you use in your pond as well. So if you're creating a new pond, then it needs to be filled from scratch. So if you can leave it fill with rainwater, that's fab. Um, and of course, a water butt um, is your best friend. <laughs> <laughs> and way behind us. <laughs> yes. Um, so filling with rainwater is the best thing that you can do. If you have to use tap water and you're filling a new pond, then we would say to fill it and then wait for a couple of days before adding any plants in. Just wait for that um, chlorine um, to come out. Um, and again, if you're topping up your pond, ideally rainwater. But again, if you're using tap water, leave it in a bucket for a mm. few days before you pour it in. Yeah, good advice. I mean, it's if you can get a water butt, I suppose is the advice, do get one because it's Definitely. so it's so much nicer to be able yeah. to, you know, collect that water for free yeah, and distribute it and not have to worry about buckets and things. But it's not Definitely. possible for everyone, but 
ideal scenario. Yeah, and yeah. your plants will thank you too throughout the whole garden. Mm. It's much better. Yeah, and certainly in the summer, because I find my, my pond, it's, it's not very large. So if we have a run of sunny weather, I have to top it up so regularly and having that, you know, water yeah. but there really helps. On to the exciting bit then now, mm -hmm. plants. What do we need to be thinking about when we're picking our plants? Well, the great thing about dragonflies is that they aren't specific to a plant species. They don't rely on specific species. So it gives us loads of creative freedom. And um, for them, it's more about the structure. So when we're putting in a pond or revamping a pond, the first group we want to think about is the submerged plants. So they provide great habitat for the larva living underneath. It means that they can hide and use those for shelter, but also to jump out at prey items. Uh, and it also puts oxygen into your water. So things like uh, common water starwort, pond, different types of pond weeds, rigid hornworts, great. And uh, we've also got water soldier. You might just need to manage uh, the growth of that one, but it's great habitat for larvae. And then from your submerged, then we're thinking about having some floating plants. Oh, we've got some damselfly action right here. Yeah, we've got some large reds perching perfectly. <laughs> to demonstrate what we're yes. talking about. Excellent, good timing. Exactly. <laughs> so floating plants do just that. They're great perching spots. Um, and great places for dragonflies to lay their eggs as well, to inject eggs into um, a lot of the float, floating plant species. Hmm. So water lilies are brilliant. You've also got things like um, water crowfoot, different species of that, which are really hmm. pretty, uh, frog bit. So there's lots of, lots of options out there to yeah. add that lovely sort of color to the surface of your pond. Brilliant, yeah. It's Great. good to have choice, isn't it? Exactly. You know, yeah. and I suppose it makes a difference where you are in the country and the size of your pond, you know, that'll affect your choices as well. So it's good to know that they're not fussy. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. There's a huge list of really great plants and it's about trying it out and see what works yeah. for your pond because some won't take and others will and it's sort mm. of figuring that out. Bit of trial and error. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and of course if you can get you know, plants from friends who've got ponds, because they can get quite expensive, can't it? So yeah. if you can kind of share pond plants with your friends, that's always a good thing, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. So how about the other types of plants then? So marginal plants. Yes, so all of our edges, as you can see here, have got really lovely diversity of marginal and emergent plants. So these are great for, for perching, for shelter. So not only do they shelter the surface of the water, but dragonflies and damselflies when the sun isn't out will be hiding in there um, so they're great for roosting at night as well and again for egg laying um, and you can have a huge list of really great species you've got marsh marigold uh, spearwort here water mint which is lovely and fragrant mm. as well uh, you've got water forget-me-not purple loose strife over on the other edge you've got yellow flag iris probably hands down one of the best because the leaves are really rigid and structured so they make great emergent oh, okay. yeah because i've got those in my pond and i love them so that's really good to hear they're fab yeah. so it's worth checking the leaves to see if you've got exuvia where the larva's crawled out and mm. done its final molt on yeah. there because they're great ones looks like it's made for dragonflies yes yeah and then a mix of rushes and sedges as well is great. Great mm. for structure and making it look really beautiful and natural, but great for um, emerging dragonflies as well. Once a pond is established then, what do we need to be thinking about in terms of maintenance? Yeah, so I think when you get started and you're adding lots of new plants, it will take a little while for it to naturally reach uh, an equilibrium you know some plants will do better than others and you're just keeping an eye and watching that balance it's normal in the first year or two to have a bit of a spurt of algae or duckweed and that's normal and nothing to worry about the plants that you put in if you've got if you've chosen you know floating plants and submerged plants they'll naturally shade out and outcompete and take the nutrients out of the water to limit your algae and duckweed. If you do need to remove a bit, that's fine as well, using a net and um, 
pulling it out to the side and then leaving it to dry on the side for a couple of days and then any invertebrates and dragonfly larvae can crawl out and back into the water right. and then you can compost what you take out. Um, thinking about the water that you put in as we mentioned using rainwater where you can will help it'll stop enriching that water which feeds the algae um, and duckweed and uh, any vegetation that falls in as well removing that like leaf litter yeah what does that do to the pond if there's too much leaf litter in it it just adds that nutrients mm. in which can upset the balance of, of mm. the plants in your in your pond and causes shade as well shades out the the submerged plants that you have underneath. And then thinking about the banks as well and the vegetation that you have on the edges. So if you uh, need to trim that back a bit or do a bit of cut in there, doing that in the winter is the best time. A lot of people aren't gonna be able to have a pond for, what, for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. Are there things that they can do to still help dragonflies? Yes, definitely. There is a way that we can support adult dragonflies um, in every garden. So that's planting for prey. So creating an insect friendly garden will bring adult dragonflies through, even if it's a stopgap. It's a little buffet on the way to your nearest wetland. <laughs> Our adult dragonflies eat other insects. So they're a really important part of the ecosystem in that in that way, they eat midges and those insects that would be out of balance without our dragonfly predators. Good thing, yeah. And they can eat larger insects too. Um, so providing lots of plants for insects means that you're supplying food for all of our different size dragonflies. So we're thinking mainly about the plants that you put in your garden. So mm. you want nectar rich, UK wildflowers ideally, that's yeah. the best. Um, when you're in your garden centre, just taking a look at what insects are interested in. That's, that's a good an thing. easy way. A lot of them are labelled now, aren't they, yeah. as well? As probably, I imagine if it says bee friendly, that probably means they're good for dragonfly prey as well, I imagine. Yes, yeah. definitely. And just avoiding things that are double-headed, those traditional bedding plants with lots of frilly petals, they won't be providing much nectar or, mm. or much of a treat for insects or um, yeah, a reason for insects to visit. So avoiding those would be great. Um, and then thinking about your lawn and how you manage your garden, so leaving areas uncut if you can. Mm -hmm. um, maybe just a corner that you don't use or just cutting paths through your grass. Yeah, that's a nice way of doing it yeah. now. I've seen that a lot in a lot of places and that's what I've sort of done. But it's, you know, having the lawn at different lengths and it's yeah. really interesting to see what comes up in the different spots, isn't it, I've found. Exactly that. I mean, you never yeah. know. You might get orchids pop up in your lawn. Yeah. Lots of people do and that's such a treat. Yeah, and it's easy. Yeah. It just means you have to do less. Yeah. So that's always a bonus, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. But that uncut grass is great shelter for dragonflies too. So mm. they will wait in there on a on a cloudier day. Yeah. Um, and then, yep, yeah, brings lots of insects in, which is a great meal. Um, and then just having wilder spots in your garden. If you've got a corner that's quite shaded and that you don't use, why not create a log pile mm. or leave your grass cuttings there, which is great for reptiles and other insects will use that to, to rest in. Uh, bee boxes, bug hotels, yeah. all those will be brilliant to bring in all kinds of insects. We'll mm. investigate those kind of hidey holes. Yeah. So yeah, all of that will bring in lots of food. You'll be a little buffet. Even <laughs> if you don't have water in your garden, then you'll pr be providing plenty of food for a passing dragonfly. That's really good to know, isn't it? Because it's not possible for everyone to have a pond. But this is something that we can all do if you have any kind of outdoor space. Yeah. We can all be providing for insects. And all of this advice you've just given is just generally good wildlife gardening advice. It's going to help so many creatures, not just dragonflies. So it's really good advice to be taken on board. Yeah. And of course, we have to mention as well, pesticides, no go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. herbicides and pesticides, leave them and garden naturally by companion planting, pulling, sort of natural management of your areas and just keeping an eye and just doing some hand pulling is a much better way to, to manage your garden. So we've talked 
about lots of things that people can do here. And thank you so much because you've given us some wonderful tips. And I do hope that we're all able to take these on board and, and create more habitat and, you know, feeding places for, for dragonflies because they're such wonderful creatures. Um, and of course, once you've taken these steps um, in your garden, if you want to find out what you're looking at, so I mean, it's difficult, isn't it? And especially because they're so fast. Yeah. But if you do manage to get a photograph, or a close look at a dragonfly. Yeah. We made a video, didn't we, last year with the British Dragonfly Society where you can identify common species in, your, in the springtime and in the summer. So if you want to find out what you're looking at, that is a good start. Yeah, so there's loads of resources to help you out. Um, and once you've gotten your eye in and like you say, you've got some pictures, then um, Take a look at the British Dragonfly Society website for information on how to submit your records. And we take all of our records through iRecord. That's one of the easiest ways to send your records to us. It's really easy to use. You can upload records as individuals or as lists if you've been looking at your pond for say an hour. And all of those records come through to us and we use every bit of data that goes through iRecord. We use it to map species. We can track how species distribution changes throughout the UK, especially in response to climate change. That information is so helpful. And it also means that we can focus our conservation efforts in the right places. So especially for records of rare and scarce species, us understanding where they are and the kind of habitat they're using is really important for, to allow us to conserve them in the future. That's all really brilliant, isn't it? Because it's, you know, all of these things, they're such major problems and it feels like you can't do anything. And that's what I love about Wildlife Garden. And you can, we can do something about this and we can help dragonflies yeah. and especially help the British Dragonfly Society by recording them. Yeah. And, you know, I think we can all do a bit and we'll get there, I think, won't we? Yes, yeah. definitely. Well, thank you so much for watching today. I really hope that you've learned something. I know I have, and I really hope that you um, are able to put some of these steps into place to help dragonflies. Thank you so much for joining us, Lauren. It's been an absolute pleasure. You've been brilliant. And, you know, if you do want to learn anything more about dragonflies, there's lots of information on the website, isn't there? Yes, we have loads of ID help, ID tips, as well as how to record, uh, great dragonfly hotspots near you, and lots more resources for what we've talked about today. So lists of great pond plants, more information on pond maintenance. So it's your one-stop shop for everything dragonfly. So you can find that at british-dragonflies.org.uk. Excellent, make sure you check that out. And of course, for more wildlife gardening tips, um, you please like this video, subscribe, do all the usual things like follow us on social media, and of course, check out our website, wildlifegardenproject.com for lots more wildlife gardening advice.